Welcome. My name is Henrik Pesunka. I'm an assistant professor in the entrepreneurship department. Today, with us, Dittmar Haarhoff, director at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. Welcome, Dittmar. Thanks, Henning. Great to be here. Your recent research has been very much focused on the mobility of inventors. I wonder if you could share with us some of the insights which you're also going to present at a seminar at INSEAD this afternoon. Yes, we found a way um, to, to come up with some great data resources. And uh, that is mostly due to efforts being undertaken at the uh, IAB, which is an agency, a research unit uh, at Germany's uh, Social Security Agency. And what we have done there has been done in other countries as well, namely to link data on individuals with social security records. We're very much interested in trying to find out uh, what happens if somebody who is knowledgeable, and inventors are highly knowledgeable, they're some of the key personnel that an innovative company has, when they move. Uh, we're interested to find out why they move. Uh, we would like to see what happens when an inventor moves into an agglomeration into a city and whether that differs, whatever happens there, whether that differs from somebody moving out of a city into a more rural area for whatever reason. Um, our first project that we have now undertaken with this kind of data looks at inventors from East Germany who prior to 1989 when the Iron Curtain came down had done successfully uh, innovation and invention in the former East German system. What most people don't know, uh, the socialist countries were not performing as well as capitalist countries and that was of course the reason for the downfall. But nonetheless, in some ways, they had interesting systems. And in that manner, in that vein, East Germany had a relatively well-working patent system. And that allows us now to see in roughly 100,000 patents that came out between 1980 and 1989, who were the inventors? What did they do? In which fields were they active? And in some cases, uh, sufficiently many cases, 25,000 cases, we're able to track them in the social security system that then was built after the after reunification uh, in the new uh, unified uh, German social security system. Um, and that really helps us now to, to see how inventors, for example, react to social ties, to networks. Uh, we find that the most prominent, the most outstanding uh, ones, the ones had that had produced technology that was also of interest to Western companies, um, move to wherever they want. Whereas other ones who have a more average portfolio uh, in what they did, were not quite that successful, very much rely on social networks and on social ties in order to find employment in the West. We find in our data, and that is uh, not completely new, but we are sort of repeating that now for this key resource inventors, that the exodus of East German inventors happened very quickly, within two years, in 1990 and 1991. Uh, that brings us to uh, the world today. Uh, East Germany still has considerably less research and development activity than West Germany. Um, and I would say this has partly to do with this early exodus effect, which we were not able to stem in time. So there are quite a number of lessons that you can develop out of such a uh, rich data set. You can learn something about the motives. You can learn something about the role of social networks. Uh, and then again, there is this link back to policy that uh, you can think about counterfactual things. What would have happened if we had kept some of these people early on uh, in new research institutions, academic institutions, and so forth uh, in the East? Would that have changed the course of history in uh, the uh, uh, economic development of the uh, eastern states in Germany. Very often when we think of innovation, we think of large companies. We think of the Googles of the world, the Sanofis, the BMWs. But if I understand this correctly, in the inventors, these are very often individuals. As far as I know, you've worked closely also with Eric von Hippel, who have emphasized the role of the individual innovation. Can you outline whether these why these individuals are so important or how much 
of a force individual inventors are in terms of innovation? Right. If you look back at the history of, of innovation and technology management, the, the research that Tom Allen has done, the research that uh, somebody like um, Eric uh, has done, but also others, it focuses very much on the individual and the team. Okay? Those are the movers and shakers. Uh, we think about how to select people into teams. We think about how to sort of run these teams. Uh, we think about sources of inspiration for the individuals. So that's the early life and, and, and world of innovation management in the 60s and 70s. And then at some point in the 80s, we decide that systems of innovation, management systems, innovation controlling, stage gate, and I don't know what else is becoming very important. And I do not deny that that is important, but it took over completely. We essentially eradicated research on the individual. And I think that was a big mistake. And right now, I think the pendulum is swinging back in the other direction, and rightfully so. We're trying to find a new balance between having, in large companies, systems that allow for processes that generate creativity or support creativity. But at the same time, we have to think again about the individuals. And we're driven in that direction also by another development that was observable in the United States a long time uh, ago already, which is the rise of startups, the rising importance of startups, which has now also reached Europe. I mean, there's no uh, uh, larger corporation in Europe anymore that does not try to apply open innovation, and as a part of open innovation, tries to engage with startups, because uh, the heads of R&D and innovation functions have realized that their internal functions can never come up with the wealth of ideas or new concepts that are needed to feed the innovation machinery of industry. So there are two essentially drivers now behind that that I think make sort of thinking about individuals, uh, the inventors, the innovators, the intrapreneurs, the entrepreneurs um, more important. And I think it's also very fruitful and, 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 and inspirational and great fun uh, to do that as uh, academics. Whenever I go into an INSEAD classroom, one of the key questions students have is how can I transform an idea into a business? Mm -hmm. What would be your main advice on what are the key steps to on this process? We're seeing in a, a world where everybody has ideas, everybody is creative, uh, where in certain uh, environments like your classroom, uh, we, we even push people, we encourage having these ideas, and then bam, they're there. And then the key question becomes what to do with them and how to bring them into a shape that our societies can profit from them, how to sort of uh, grow them. And of course, entrepreneurship is one uh, wonderful possibility of doing that. But before we go into that, let's also say there are others. You could make a contribution to a community, uh, a open software community and uh, a, a crowdsourcing community that engages in idea collection and so forth. So you could bring it into that. You may want to do all of that in an entrepreneurial context because you see your future in entrepreneurship. You want to be the CEO or a C-level uh, individual uh, in a new company and you see your future in growing uh, the idea uh, in your own field. I think the, uh, from my observation as running an entrepreneurship center uh, at the University of Munich, but also having seen quite a number of teams at the German Accelerator, um, I think the, the first really, really important step is team formation. Uh, finding uh, people who are willing, uh, together with you, to battle it out. Um, Unfortunately, the observation is that many of these teams will not be kept together, that uh, it's a very strenuous, a very frustrating process as you go along. Uh, and that sort of confirms to me personally how important this initial phase is. So don't compromise when you select your teams. Try to find people who are sufficiently different, but who are sort of on the same wavelength with you in terms of ambition, in terms of vision. I think that's a, a major, a very, very important first step towards a good entrepreneurial outcome.